Hey, welcome to Chat Chat. I'm your host Chetna, and with me today on the show is Neil Satra. Hey, Neil, welcome to the show. Thanks, thanks for having me. Neil is a bachelor's and a master's in CompSci Computer Science from University of Cambridge. He's also the recipient of the very prestigious Manmohan Singh Scholarship, full scholarship for four years. And he's also the founder, co-founder, and CTO of Magi Matrix. So, Neil, thank you so much for coming on the show. And the first thing I really want to ask you is, how did you decide to do comp sci as a major? Yeah. So, I guess I was luckier than most students in that aspect, and that I already had a hobby, and that hobby turned out to be a subject that you could study in college, and that turned out to be a, a career that you could follow. So, for me, it was kind of easier. Um, but some of the traits that kind of typical students who end up enjoying computer science are if you kind of enjoy math, logic, puzzles, that kind of stuff at an earlier age. Um, if you're highly analytical and can kind of work through problems very objectively, that's the kind of people I find. Um, especially from my school, the the people that tend to come through are usually very highly self-motivated to kind of learn it. So. It's not necessarily that they've studied computer science in school, and the course is designed in a way that it's friendly to someone who hasn't done any computer science before. Yeah, or at least that's what they say on paper. Right. But um, usually, a lot of the students have done some programming or some have had some sort of exposure to it before. Okay, but huh. mathematical skills in general help uh, more. Perhaps then programming experience is what you see. Yeah, I think the layman's um, perspective on computer science is that it's a lot of programming or a lot of kind of hardware-specific stuff. But actually, computer science, rather than the software development that's used in industry, the academic field of computer science is very um, highly focused on math and the kind of abstraction of that logic. So it's it. Programming is one element of it, certainly, but math is kind of the core on which it's all based. I think the Cambridge experience was really great for me because it was very differentiated from maybe what I imagined the typical college experience to be. Um, just because it's had this long tradition with all their quirks and their weird cultural aspects. Um, so it took a lot of kind of getting used to, but you get accustomed to it so quickly that within a week you're speaking words that other people don't understand. So you're like, oh, I've got to go to my bop and I've got to check my pidge and at the plodge and like <laughs> these words don't make sense to anyone else. Um, and certainly to, to kind of people who ask me if they should go abroad to study right. rather than studying in India, right. that's the kind of aspect I focus on because in terms of studies, you're going to get fairly similar content everywhere, but the experience of actually being independent in this kind of strange foreign culture to yourself, I think is, is very crucial, at least in my kind of development. A lot of the stuff I saw changing about me was not just the knowledge that I had, but the attitude I took, the confidence I had interacting with other people, um, my kind of perspective on the world and I think that that's kind of crucial. Wow, and Cambridge has this beautiful location by the river, so... It does, it does and um, it's kind of nice in a few ways, so it's, it's a small town but there's a lot going on, right. so you kind of get the best of both worlds, so you can... I cycle to my labs every day in maybe 15 minutes and that's good exercise for someone as sedentary as me if you're just sitting in front of a computer all day. Um, you're surrounded by nature, so I constantly see people posting their morning jog pictures and it's these beautiful cathedrals that are 800 years old um, and you have all these tourists flocking to, to see this place. And for us, we don't even really realize the value of it until we're about to lose it. Like there's, there's this popular story of an American um, tourist coming to Cambridge and saying like, is this college pre-Civil War or post-Civil War? And the tourist guide says, this college existed before your country did. <laughs> and that was amazing. That's not true. Yeah. Neil, one of the questions I get a lot is the US versus UK debate. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'd love to hear your views on that. Yeah, sure. I, I certainly had the same debate myself. 
Um, and like many Indian families tend to, I was very US centric for a long time. Um, just because you see a lot of news coming out of that, especially for someone in the tech world, a lot of the kind of innovation is happening there, and so that's where all the focus is. Um, but then while applying, I just cast the net wider just for the sake of why not. Um, and actually, then my choice boiled down to um, Carnegie Mellon, UC Berkeley, and Cambridge in the UK. Oh, fantastic! All three top schools in the region of in computer science. Yeah, I, I was certainly interested in some of the best computer science schools. So this was a good choice to have for sure, um, which made it a lot harder because you, yeah, they were all good choices. Um, in the end, for me, one of the motivation motivating factors was, of course, that I got the scholarship for the UK. Um, whereas the US would have been more expensive. Um, the other thing specific to UK universities that a lot of people might consider is obviously that you choose your subject beforehand right. and then you're Stick kind of... To it. Right, right. Um, so for me, I knew I wanted to do computer science, so this was not so much of an objection. But if there's any shred of uncertainty in you and there's a chance that you might want to explore, um, then I would certainly consider the US system just because you have that flexibility and not locking yourself down too early. And especially a lot of the subjects that people end up choosing at, at college, they weren't exposed to at school, so there was no way of knowing that they'd be interested in these. Um, the other aspect was, even though I knew I wanted to do computer science as my main subject, I was still interested in doing a lot of minors, so I wanted to do a bit of economics, a bit of psychology, just kind of understand the, a, a broader kind of uh, field. Right, exactly. That was kind of limited in the UK to some extent. I got lucky in my course that computer science in Cambridge happened to include an option to do a minor. Um, and so a lot of other people also chose psychology and there was some economics, some law, some business advice in the computer science course, which was great. But if that exact combination doesn't happen to be available to you, then I would consider the US. The other thing that in retrospect I realized was valuable was I was quite fixated in what I wanted to do. So even within computer science, I had specific units in mind. I wanted to do stuff related to software, related to machine learning. And there was a lot of other stuff to computer science, which I just kind of dismissed preliminarily. And had I been in the US, I would have probably had the flexibility to just focus down on what I wanted to do. But the UK system actually forced me to learn the fundamentals of each of these areas. And as much as you like to think that you can, you can hyper-specialize in one field without understanding the context, really it's those fundamentals that have helped me a lot since then. Um, the way my director of studies at, at my college, Pembroke, put it was, the implementation details in the field like technology keep changing, right? So what's popular today was not popular two years back and what was popular two years back was unheard of two, uh, two years before then. So if, you're, if you get really focused on the details, um, you're going to have a hard time adapting to the changes as they come about. But if you understand the underlying concepts, then whatever the, the hot fa uh, technology of the week is, you're going to be able to pick it up fairly easily. And finally, with Oxbridge, so Oxford and Cambridge, um, we have this tutorial system and in Cambridge we call it supervisions. We have lectures by day and you have kind of one lecturer, maybe about 60 to 70 students in a, in a hall and that format does not work for me at all. I, I can't sit passively as someone is talking to me for an hour, my attention span is just not long enough. So that's where the supervisions came in. So after having four lectures on a topic, we'd have a supervision. So you would, you would have some work pre-assigned before the supervision. You finish it and then you go in to meet either a grad student or a professor in that field. It's just one or two students uh, with one professor. So it's really individual, it's really personalized and that was amazing for me. So I don't know if I should say this, but I stopped going to lectures fairly early on. But, <laughs> but the supervisions I would never miss because they were so valuable. Um, and you could really tailor that to be the education you wanted it to be. So in my case, I would, I would enjoy kind of poking holes in some of the concepts and being like, why doesn't it work this way? Or why, why was this designed this way? And that's the kind of flexibility you can have when you're one-on-one -on -one or one or two with these guys. And the other thing is, it really makes sure that you understand the topic rather than just memorizing it or just learning it till a test and then forgetting it. Um, because you really have to discuss it with these guys and some of them, uh, of course the, uh, the quality is variable but some of them really know how to grill you on your concepts and they will identify if you haven't understood it. 
Um, so it was kind of a treadmill. You were constantly working, and because it was eight-week terms, it was fairly intense. Oh, so that breaks the myth of that one final exam uh, in the UK, and here you have to keep working continuously. Right. So after being in school, where I was used to the IGCSE and IB system, where I was doing constant tests, and I really enjoyed that compared to the final exam system, I felt like the UK was a regression back to the old Indian system, which I guess we got from the British. But because of these supervisions, it actually changes that that atmosphere completely. Because you're not required to do any work, you're not being assessed on your supervisions. But you have this kind of intrinsic motivation that if you don't get the most out of it, it's you who are losing out on this resource that's available to you. But because we do have final exams rather than constant testing, when I spoke to my friends in American universities, the the kind of feeling that I got was definitely that they had less control over the, their time than I did. So I could choose to schedule more supervisions for one week and do more week more work one week and then take the next week off to work on something that I'm interested in outside of college. Um, whereas for them, I think the, the kind of schedule was more top down and they were kind of on that treadmill the whole time. Neil, there's another sort of drawback, if I may say, mm -hmm. that people think the UK has is the visa, mm -hmm. so which I'm told expires within a few months of the course getting over. Sure. And there's also this sort of rush to go into Silicon Valley. So what, what's your take on all of this? In general, they have been tightening down on visa regulations for, for the masses. Um, but for the kind of students that are probably looking at these videos and are targeting decent universities, the process is still fairly welcoming. Um, they've had lots of problems in the past with people coming in with kind of sh scam universities and just staying on. Fresh out of college, yes, you do have a shorter window to get a job. Um, in kind of STEM fields like computer science and engineering, there is a lot of demand, especially if you're at maybe one of the top five or top ten universities, you're not going to have any trouble. There's constantly companies coming to recruit you. Um, and in fact, that's one of the other big advantages of being in the UK is there's a few big colleges and there's a lot of people recruiting for Europe. Um, so a lot of the attention is focused on places like Oxford and Cambridge and Imperial and Warwick. Um, so in terms of the visa, yes, you, you do have to, you have a shorter timeline to get a job sorted. Um, once you do, the process is much less onerous and uncertain than the US, so there's no lottery if you get a job and you apply and you tick all the boxes, you get it, you, there's, there's no quota. There are a lot more avenues for getting visas, so it's not just getting a job, but for someone like me, um, a big disadvantage, disadvantage to being in the US would have been that I would have to work for someone straight out of the gate, I would not be able to work for myself because the visa system doesn't support that. But in the UK, if you want to work on your own startup, there's a, there's a visa category for that. Um, if you studied in the UK, your UK university just signs off on your business plan and then you get a few years to work on that. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility that way. The government is kind of more aggressive in passing regulation quicker because they want to encourage that kind of talent to come to the UK rather than the US. Okay, so you mentioned that UK is very open for startups, mm -hmm. especially if you studied in, in uh, the UK itself. But how about moving to the US uh, in a job, for instance, mm -hmm. after you're studying in the UK? How does that system work? Sure, yeah. So a lot of the larger tech companies, which is the kind of company I have experience with, um, are based in America, but are slowly moving over to Europe just because they need to aggressively recruit a lot of engineering talent and they're kind of finding it hard in the US. So all three of my summers, I was interning with American companies, but based around the world. So the first year I was with Morgan Stanley in London. Um, the second year I was with Microsoft in uh, Silicon Valley. And in my final year, I was with Google, but in Zurich in, in Switzerland. So certainly they, they all come to Cambridge, especially um, we have a, we have a job fair where these companies kind of pay the computer lab in order to advertise to the students and they have stalls there they have a lot of talks advertising kind of what kind of interesting problems they're working on um, it's a really good environment and they're going fairly aggressively after after uk students so in fact for my microsoft internship they were recruiting right on campus so right next to our computer lab they have a microsoft research building yes. And so the interview was just going over to the next building and talking to someone for half an hour. Yeah, the Gates Centre. Right, exactly, yeah. And there are just about 100 computer science students in Cambridge, so how difficult would that be? Right. 
Yeah, so I think they have some statistics regarding there being um, three to five companies applying to advertise at the careers fair for every student that we have. Um, and obviously a lot more job offers per company. So it is certainly, it's, it's not going to be a challenge for computer science students at least. Fabulous. Yeah. And the startup environment too, you feel in Europe is more vibrant today? Yeah, I think it's an interesting time in Europe uh, for startups. So in the US, certainly they've been doing it for a while. Uh, they've had systems in place and they're kind of creaking, but they're going along. In the UK, they've seen where what's possible with startups. And so now they're trying to catch up from behind. And that can mean good things for people like us, right? So when they're aggressively pushing for this, um, they're, they're actually involving people like us in the discussion. So I was involved in a startup accelerator um, in my third year that is based in London. Um, they had initially support from the government and now from private investors to encourage startups in the UK. And as part of that, we actually went to number 10 Downing Street. We, we went to the prime minister's office um, spoke to their advisors on how to encourage the startup environment there. And certainly when there's so much political will for it, there is a lot of support. So in terms of visas, in terms of funding, um, they even support private investors to back us. So it's not just that you have to convince kind of governments who might not be great at investing, but private investors as well are de-risked in their investment because the government backs them. And so there's a lot of funding available now. So it's an interesting time to be there. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit and big problems that are yet to be solved. And so if you're kind of interested in solving big problems rather than being yet another food delivery startup or yet another startup that does laundry services for rich Bay Area kids, then the UK is a nice place to be. Please click the subscribe button below like me at facebook.com slash chatchat101, follow my Twitter handle chatchat101 or at Instagram chatchat101. Please leave your comments in the sections below and if you'd like me to feature any particular college, please let me know. Thank you.